Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Journey. I'm Michael, your host, and today we're going to be talking about pet genetics. Stay tuned. Welcome, everybody, to our room today. We're in Healthy Paws, and we're talking about healthy breeds, genetic testing, and what it's all about. I'm so excited today because we've got Dr. Lisa Schaefer here today, and she's the founder of Paw Print Genetics, and we're going to be breaking down what that means, genetics. We've heard about genetic testing, but on dogs? Really? Let's check it out. For your dog, who knew? I never knew. And I just love that she does this and all the things that we're going to be discovering today. And one of the big things we want to talk about is Breeze. But before I go there, I want to introduce her. Hi, Lisa. Thank you, Michael. Um, Yeah, I started Paw Print Genetics in 2012. Um, I'm a board certified um, geneticist, a human geneticist. And um, I had been doing human diagnostic testing my whole career. And in 2012, I decided I wanted to do something um, that would, you know, benefit our um, furry friends. So I started Paw Print Genetics. We do dog um, inherited disease testing, trait testing, and we do cat um, inherited disease and trait testing. I think it's so fascinating. I can't wait to learn more about it. And I would love to introduce Carrie. Carrie, if you're in the room, you've been in the room in Clubhouse for a while, you know, everyone knows Carrie. Um, she's the founder of Spleesh, the Spleesh that connects to your leash that houses 12 ounces of water and keeps your dogs safe during summer. Um, Carrie, I would love for you to introduce yourself. And how do you, how do you know Dr. Lisa? Hey, thanks, Michael. Yeah. So I um, met Lisa when she hired me um, back, oh my gosh, seems like a million years ago. I want to say like 2009-ish or something like that um, to work for her company that she had at the time called Signature Genomics. And uh, she was a pioneer in developing microarray testing for um, the medical community for people. And um, we worked together until um, she sold the company and um, sold it to a big group called Perk and Elmer. And, um, you know, we kind of went on our separate path. She started up Paw Print and I went and worked for Illumina for a number of years. And um, then I came up with my idea and invented my pet product. And now we find ourselves in the pet industry together. Um, although in totally different segments, um, but it, it's so fun to be able to talk with her and continue to learn from her. She's just got so much uh, knowledge, both on the human genetic side, but um, the animal genetic side is it's just phenomenal to be able to learn from her and, and then, you know, bring her to, to a Clubhouse so that she can share with all the folks um, and, and hopefully enlighten some people on the the best testing to use in um, in regards to your animals. I love it. And I'm so excited about it. So tell me, Lisa, about, so Lisa, will you share with us Signature Genomics? Yeah. So with my previous company, um, I um, am a specialist at looking at something called chromosomes, which are the structures in your cells that carry your genes. And um, that's my expertise. And I was using a technique in my research lab. I'm also interested in the chromosomal basis of um, medical problems and learning disabilities, things like that. And I um, worked a lot on Down syndrome, if anybody's familiar with Down syndrome, where you have an extra chromosome 21. So I... Um, in my research lab, we developed a way to scan the genome um, and identify chromosome abnormalities in a really simple overnight experiment without having to look through the microscope. When you look through the microscope, you're looking for changes in the chromosomes that are sometimes you can't see. They're too small. And this new technology, microarrays, which I didn't invent microarrays. All I did was apply it to chromosome analysis. Anyway... The, the long, it's a very long story, but the short story is that I took this new technique, started a company around it because it was really the only way I could get it done. And I knew that we were missing things by looking through the microscope. And as a medical geneticist, I didn't want to miss anything. So anyway, started Signature Genomics, the first company on the planet to use this technique to look 
for gains and losses of chromosomal material in mostly babies and children. And now every cytogenetic laboratory, instead of looking through microscopes, they actually use this, this technique now. So I'm very proud of that. Signature genomics really changed the way that um, medical genetics was done for children with developmental disabilities. And so when that journey was sort of over for me, I decided I wanted to do similar things in that I wanted to go into the pet industry and really disrupt the way that genetic testing was being done for pets. It, it, you know, if it was being done well, I would not have started this company. But I did my market research. I took samples on Trixie the wiener dog, my dog, and sent samples to all of the existing labs. So we're not the only lab that does this. But I just found a lot of gaps in the market. And I, and I analyzed those gaps and realized that we could do it better. And we have done it better. We are the leading um, laboratory for um, inherited diseases in dogs. We offer um, nearly 300 different tests for dogs um, in over 350 different breeds, as well as mixed breed dogs. So um, I'm, again, very proud of my group. A lot of the people that worked for me at Signature Genomics work for me now at Pawprint Genetics. And um, we're just doing great things in the pet industry. We've really changed the, the way that people are viewing um, disease testing in dogs because um, it just, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but it just wasn't being done very well. You know, you had a few tests in each of the different laboratories, whereas DNA is DNA. We just do it all. So anything that you need done in your dog, regarding inherited diseases or inherited traits, we do it. And so we have the largest menu and we have the best customer service. We actually answer the phone when you call us. And so it just really was, um, again, kind of disrupting this marketplace that was actually quite old. A lot of these other laboratories have been around for 20 or 25 years. And here we were, the new kids on the block, and we basically just came in and said, you know what, this is the way it needs to be done. Great customer service, high accuracy, and a large menu. So no matter what you need done on your dog, whether you're a breeder, you're a concerned dog owner, or you're a veterinarian, you can find that at Paw Print Genetics. When people, like, I had no idea that Paw Pet Genetics existed until last week. I had no idea you existed until I jumped into your room with Carrie a couple of weeks ago. And I was so fascinated about what you do when you left your last job and you decided that you, like you're saying that there was not a lot of, let's say uh, integrity with the other companies and you saw the missing link there and you thought, okay, this is something I want to get involved with. Was pets always on your mind or was just, you just happened on it. So when I was, so I was at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston for almost 12 years, and then I was, obviously was at Signature Genomics for a number of years. And I occasionally got to do some cool cases from the San Diego Zoo where they had some maybe a primate that was born with birth defects, and they wanted us to look to see if there was a cytogenetic abnormality. And those cases were always super fun, and we did make diagnoses, which was cool because we're providing information back to the zoo. They, they ask a question and they want an answer. And, you know, even if sometimes it's a sad answer that, yes, we found that the, the chimp or the gorilla had a chromosome abnormality, at least now they have an answer for why the baby was born with problems. So, um, I, so I wanted to work with the animals on my next, you know, my next adventure. Um, I really enjoyed human health, but human health is, is become more and more difficult with reimbursement and you got to get paid so that you can pay your staff. And I decided, you know, let's do something, you know, different and fun. And I, and zoos, as much as I love working with zoo animals, they, zoos don't have the money to pay either. And again, I have to pay my staff, right? So what could I do that was interesting and still in genetics and would make a difference? And so that's why I decided to go into companion animals. But again, only after doing my market research and realizing that there were a lot of gaps in the current industry that really needed to be filled and we had the expertise to fill them. You know, with our experience in human genetics and how human genetic testing is done, 
and how human genetic results are reported back to hospitals and doctors, we realized that we could have very high accuracy, which was lacking in the marketplace, and better communication with customers because honestly, you know, one of the tests I got back on Trixie, I got an email that said carrier. I couldn't even remember what I sent on, you know, what which particular test it was. I didn't even get a formal report from that laboratory. So I immediately saw that there, you know, was a lack of communication with the customer, a lack, lack of support for the customer. So we provide genetic counseling. We don't expect everybody to be geneticists. So when you get your results from us, you know, we're happy to sit down with you over the phone. You know, it's usually over the phone because not, not a lot of our customers are in Spokane, Washington, where we're located. But we'll talk to you over the phone or we'll correspond with you via email because our testing just doesn't stop with the results. It's really, really important to us that you understand your results and how to use those results, whether it's taking the report to your veterinarian so that your dog can be treated appropriately or using those results in your breeding program to avoid producing puppies with diseases. So we're, you know, from, from start to finish, you know, we're the go-to lab because we'll help you order the appropriate test. We want to make sure you're ordering only those tests that are appropriate. And again, this comes from my human genetics training. We would only do testing in, in babies and children if the test was appropriate for their clinical condition. And I feel the same way. You know, I'm not going to do, you know, a Yorkshire Terrier panel on a Labrador. If we see a, an order come through and the dog is marked as a Labrador, but they ordered a Yorkshire Terrier panel, I'm going to assume it's an accident. and We will call you and say, did did you really think that you wanted this? Or maybe your lab's just acting like a Yorkie and, you know, you really want the lab panel. So anyway, we're really about high quality, high accuracy, and and we really care about our customers. I was in a room previous to this with John Waters, and he's a veterinarian in Colorado, and we were talking, I brought your company up with him, and we were talking about it because he says that it's so important for some dog owners with certain breeds really get these tests so they really know what they're in for for the health and care of their dog and you mentioned labradors and he mentioned labradors too because they're so prone to hip issues and joint issues and all that how often are you seeing now do you have since you started your company are you seeing a big influx of people really wanting to know this information and coming to you and when they come to you are they do they need guidance and to do this or is it pretty simple just to say i need this test and i want to see what it means so, um, yeah, it's a great question. We have set up the website that you can go to the website, which is simply paw print genetics with an S on the end dot com. And you can look up your breed and you can see all the tests that we offer for your breed. Um, so, I'm, so some breeds picking on the Yorkshire Terriers still, you know, we'll have a small number of, of tests that are offered. But then there's other breeds like Labradors. I think we offer 17 different tests for Labradors. So we have people that reach out and say, oh my gosh, I don't know what to order. Well, then we point them out, point them back to their page and we point out the fact that we have broken your test into um, an essential panel, which we feel every breeding dog should have the essential panel. And then we have, because those are the most common and or severe conditions. And then the next tier is the supplemental panel for people who want to just test for everything. And then we'll even in some breeds have a, have a third tier, which are additional tests, which are not as common in your breed, but we want to have them on your breed page in case your veterinarian sees a dog and the dog has one of these really rare conditions. They can find it easily on that breed page. So some breed pages like the Labrador Retriever, they have a lot of information, but most people just order either individual tests because those are what concern them because they know their their dog's history or they'll order the essential panels. Um, and so we've tried to make it really easy, but then we do get people who email us and say, I have a standard poodle and I don't know where to begin. And then we, you know, we'll talk them through it because we really only want to sell to you what you need. And so we don't say, oh, just order everything on that page. We never say that. We ask questions, you know, well, what are you looking for? What is the purpose of the testing? And if someone came to us and said, I have an older dog 
let's say a five-year-old dog, and I just want to know about its health, I'm not even going to sell you the essential panel because the essential panel is really for breeding dogs and there's conditions on there that would affect the dog in its first year of life. And so if your dog is already now five years old, don't order those tests because your dog is beyond the age that they would be affected with those diseases. So again, we help you, you know, figure out what you need because again, we only want you to order what you need. And so in that case, I would recommend tests for older dogs, such as some of the eye conditions that are late onset blindness, where a dog can go blind later in years. Um, but I would not recommend the, you know, the tests that occur in the first year of the dog's life. So things like that. So we really help the customers figure out what they need to order. Um, but some people like to do it themselves. And so if they go to our website, they can read and they can figure out also on their own you know, which things they want to order. I did the 23andMe genetics and I know we, I heard you talk about this and I want to bring this up as well is I did it because people always ask me like, what are you made of? What's your background? And, they, and I didn't know, I didn't know who my grandfather was on my mom's side. And there was a couple of missing elements here and there. So I didn't know. So I did the 23andMe because I wanted to know what I was made of. We were talking, you and I were talking about, and you have a term for this because this is really not what genetic testing is about for your company and your mission and what you see, because you see, like you mentioned, other companies do, what do you call the word, what the term is? Entertainment genetics. Entertainment genetics. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because I think a lot of people have that misunderstanding of like why they would be getting a genetic test, or maybe because this is new to me, maybe I have that misunderstanding. Um, is why would I need it? Now that we've been talking, I see that if I had a Labrador, I definitely want to, after talking to Dr. John and talking to you, I do want to see where my genetics are in my Labrador and if there's anything going on that I need to look at for the future. So let's talk about entertainment genetics. What is entertainment genetics? Yeah, so, yeah, so starting, let's talk about 23 Me for a minute. Um, I think, you know, it's a great test if you want to get that handful of health conditions that they test for. But when I got my, because I did 23 me as well as a science project for one of my kids. And when we got our results back and it said that my favorite ice cream was chocolate, well, I could have already told you that, right? And you don't need a genetic test for that. So that's the sort of thing that I think is entertainment genetic. Um, and in a sense, breed identification is also entertainment genetics. For anyone who's done breed identification and the results come back and you're like, huh, yeah, okay, I can see the beagle and I can see the Labrador and yeah, I get, yeah, I get that those ears look like Chihuahua. But then when you get a result back where you're pretty certain your dog is 100% Labrador and it says, you know, it's 20% Husky and you know, 15% Afghan hound, you're like, mm, I don't think so. I think I just wasted my money. And that's the problem is um, these breed identification tests, they're fun. I mean, they're fine to do. They make great cocktail conversation. It's just that you don't want to make any health decisions based on that. And some companies are, are saying, you know, learn more about your dog because if you know what breeds are made up in it, you might buy different dog food. You might, you know, exercise them more. And honestly, every dog needs high quality dog food. Every dog needs exercise. Um, and what you really want to know, are there any health issues that were inherited from the parents that are lurking in my dog's DNA that I can actually be proactive about? So an example is my dachshund Frankie. So if you haven't figured it out yet, I have Dachshunds. <laughs> so Frankie Love and him. Trixie are Dachshunds and Squeegee. Squeegee's my new Dachshund. <laughs> Cute. And, Love um, the yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, Frankie was found to have two copies of a recessive. So you have to have two copies of recessive to be affected with a eye disease that's affecting the retina, which is the back of the eye eventually she's going to go blind and this is really good information to know i mean i don't think anything different of frankie other than i actually that makes me love her more and want to protect her more and i also want to make sure that when she starts losing her eyesight that 
I recognize this, that it's not something else that's going on with her. And she does go to the ophthalmologist now every six months because I know about this problem. So doing health testing can help you be very proactive about your dog's health. And there's some, so this particular retinal eye disease is not treatable, but there are lots of genetic diseases that are treatable. And knowing that and knowing that you can now have a discussion with your veterinarian and you can actually put your dog on, you know, um, certain uh, vitamin therapies, like something like cobalamin malabsorption, they need to take the B vitamins, um, things like that, where you can be super proactive about their health. Um, and for things like, you know, Frankie's eye disease, there's other diseases that are, are, occur that are inherited that occur in old age. You may not be able to do anything about it other than recognize that the dog is starting to show symptoms and then have a conversation with your veterinarian on how you can make your dog more comfortable for the rest of their life. Visiting with Dr. John, and I'm so excited that I had the room prior to this room with Dr. John because we talked about this, and he, and he was so adamant. He works with dogs with orthopedic issues, you know, and he was talking about how important it is to be able to get these tests and have them in front of you. Exactly what you're talking about, Dr. Lisa, is that that way it sets you up and sets your dog up to win because you already know what's the, you know, a potential future issue that's happening. And he, going back to Labradors, he said the big thing is like Labradors have a lot of hip issues. And if you have these tests, you can immediately understand that your dog is going to somewhere down the line, need additional help or assistance with his hips. And there are things that you can do before that happens that will lessen that issue potentially from coming on. Even if you really take care of your dog so i think these tests are just to me it's just so it's the wave of the future it's where we're going it's like stem cells the way we're going eventually everything's going to be stem cells but just being able to see these markers identify them in your own dog are so important carrie really quick with dr lisa you went to work with dr lisa for a while what what was your part in the whole um system Uh. (laughs) I was in uh, on the sales team, and I was responsible. I'm trying to remember back this far, but um, I was responsible for a, a geographical territory to sell the, um, the the testing that Signature Genomics had available for for humans at the time. And um, I called on you know labor- other laboratories, hospitals, um, physician offices within my my territory. Well, and with that background and that knowledge and knowing what Dr. Lisa is doing today with the pets, do you see that that's going to be such an easier position to be in with the pets now because of the way I've learned here on Clubhouse how much people are paying attention to their pets, how much they want to know about their pets, and how they want their pets to be set up to win? Do you see that instead of having going to these doctor's office, that with Dr. Lisa is now embarked on this incredible journey and that's you know hello the journey michael the journey um and that's why i wanted to know what your journey was dr lisa do you see that that's a whole different world and it just is such a it's it's a fun world to work in absolutely i mean i think first of all um in in dealing with any medical related thing for for um, people dealing with insurance and reimbursement of any new test or technology, medication, you know, whatever the case may be, it's incredibly um, daunting task to bring a new product to the market. Um, there's, you know, codes that have to be developed and requirements that have to be met. And, and that's all great, but it also comes with so much bureaucracy and really slows down the access to that cutting edge technology. Um, so n- being in the pet uh, space now there is pet insurance now and i'm sure they're covering certain things in the, the genetic testing world but it is just a little bit of a different story when you're trying to um, increase uptake of a particular uh, test or technology you don't have that um, reimbursement nightmare to go through that you do with um, with people's insurance at least that's my opinion anyway well, and that was one of my questions. Dr. Lisa, are you finding that pet insurance companies are coming on board saying, yes, let's do this? So we've had conversations with two different insurance companies, and actually they don't really quite know what to do with us. Um, 
because they they currently do cover pre-existing conditions and right now they don't really want to know about them. So I guess that's better for the consumer. You know, if you have a dog and you've done genetic testing and you know that they're predisposed for, let's say, eye lens dislocation, which if the lens of the eye dislocates, so these are dogs like, you know, for example, rat terriers, it's a, and, and Australian cattle dogs is another one. And if the lens dislocates, it's an emergency situation. It's usually like $4,000 an eye to have that situation corrected. Um, they have to remove the lens so that it doesn't damage the rest of the eye. Um, and the insurance companies, they really just don't want to know about these pre-existing conditions. So I think that's great for the consumer because you can still do genetic testing and, and without fear of losing your mm. dog's health insurance. And yet you can still be proactive about their health and understand, you know, that, you know, dogs with the PLL mutation uh, will eventually, during their lifetime, their lens will dislocate, um, you know, if they live long enough. And you can understand whether the signs, what does it look like when your dog's lens is dislocating? You know, they're pawing at their eye, their eye is tearing. You know, and you realize it's an emergency situation because you have to get that lens removed. Otherwise, it affects the entire globe of the eye and the dog can lose the entire eye. So these are the sorts of things. I mean, that sounds really scary, but knowledge is power. You know, now you're able to know, you know, you can't know everything, right? But you can understand at least the common conditions that are in your breed and what to look for if your dog is at risk. And then if you start seeing these signs and symptoms, you know you need to react and you need to do something to care for them. So it's really powerful and, you know, and people that have, I guess my point is people who have these insurances on their dogs should not be afraid of genetic testing because right now the insurance companies are not asking about pre-existing conditions. Do, uh, that could change. Do you, yeah, do you think insurance company one day will ask for this? Well, so in human genetics, you can't discriminate against pre-existing conditions. I don't know if the gene laws would hold true for animals or not, um, but only time will tell. I would say that animal genetics is probably about 10 to 15 years behind human testing. And so it's just now, you know, the consumer is learning about animal genetics through, you know, Clubhouse and just by, you know, reading on the web. They're learning about it through their breeder. They're learning about it through their friends. The breeders now, which is great, there's a lot of peer pressure among breeders to do genetic testing. Um, and so, you know, I hope that this means that healthier puppies are being produced. Um, and so I think, you know, in the next few years, we'll probably see those insurance companies now reaching back out to us and saying, can we have those conversations again? Let us understand how genetic testing can impact the dog, can impact premiums for the um, owner, you know, that sort of thing. Well, it, for the owner, it's just so beautiful because it gives them such an insight of the future of their dog. And if, let's say, like you're talking about the retina, the lens removing off their eyes, it's like $4,000, then they can even prepare for that cost potentially if it's something that's in the future for their dog. So like you said, knowledge is powerful. We talked about this over the phone and I'm really super excited about this. And I just, I've been trying to hold back and asking this question, question, but I think it's such an important topic that we talked about. I believe, and this is my belief already, my belief, I always make these beliefs. And once I start to hear a company and what they do, it's like, I always like, wow, this is a beautiful, incredible opportunity for people. Breeders. We talked a little bit about breeders, the byline up above healthy breeds. You have breeders that will come to you and actually do these tests so that they have these certificates and analysis for the potential new puppy owners to take a look at or is it just for them just to see how their breed and how strong their breed is so the breeders will come to us and they will breed their um dams and sires so the moms and the dads and if the moms and the dads don't carry any of the genetic abnormalities or the genetic changes in the dna then they can actually get what's called clear by parentage certificates from us on those puppies and they can sell those puppies and send the puppies home with a clear by parentage certificate so that people know 
that those puppies came out of dogs that were genetically tested and were clear for at least the diseases that we know about, right? And a good breeder is going to also send home a contract where, you know, they guarantee the health of the puppy for some certain amount of time. So it's our clear by parentage program. And a lot of breeders use that program so that they can prove to their puppy buyers that they are doing genetic testing and that this puppy is clear for at least the common, the known, you know, genetic diseases that are found in that particular breed. I would think every breeder out there would want to do this. Um, so breeder, yeah. I mean, I would too. And I, as a consumer, I would ask for it. Um, some breeders just show the parental certificates, you know, that the parents were done and had genetic testing. And then other breeders go to the extra step to ask for the clear by parentage certificates. Um, and then there's a, another step they can do. We actually have a public website. It's, it's again, it's pawprintgenetics.com slash paw, um, pedigree and then backslash again. So it's called Paw Print Pedigrees. You can also get to it just by Googling Paw Print Pedigrees. And Paw Print Pedigrees is a free website to our customers where they can actually create a breeder profile and they can display their dogs that they've tested and actually show the genetic results on the dogs that they've tested. This doesn't cost our customers anything extra, and it's a website that they can use. But more importantly, when people call us and they say, you know, I'm looking for a toy poodle. Um, can you tell me, you know, one of your good breeders that, you know, is breeding toy poodles? Well, we can't and we don't. So we take your information very seriously. It's private. We don't share your information with any third party. Um, but what we can do is if you have used paw print genetics and you have voluntarily displayed your results on paw print pedigrees, We'll tell people, well, go to Paw Print Pedigrees and put in Toy Poodle under breed, and you will find all of the breeders that have voluntarily posted their results so that you can look at their results. And then their kennel information is there, so you can actually reach out to them. And we, on Paw Print Pedigrees, we have people that have had one litter their whole life, and that's all they're going to do. And we have people that have, you know, one or two litters a year, and we have people we're breeding dogs is their business and they have lots of dogs, you know, on their profiles, but it's a really great way. It's completely public for you to go and find a breeder that does genetic testing. Yeah. I'm looking at it right now and I'm looking at Doberman Pinschers. And so I see shared dogs. Like you said, the one, one person listed eight dogs, another seven, and some have zero. Why do they have zero? So as a customer, you can um, just make a um, breeder profile there's no requirement that you actually have to display your dog's results. So okay. that's why some people just have a breeder profile, but they have decided not to um, push their results to that site. So once some, let's say someone comes here and they find a breeder, they like the breeder, the, their dogs have been tested and all that, would this, the person then get their own dog tested at some point? Um, we recommend that. So a couple things we recommend. One is, unfortunately, in the dog breeding business, as well as I'm sure other businesses, there can be fraud. So if you um, if you are going to buy a puppy and you found the breeder on paw print pedigrees, I think that's a really good sign that that's a good breeder because they're willing to show their results to the public. Um, but if you find a breeder who says, oh, yeah, we, we do genetic testing and, yeah, we use paw print genetics, Get the reports on the parents and get copies of those reports. Take a picture with your with your cam with your fo um, phone and email those to us, and we will authenticate those reports for you. Um, we get sent reports and certificates that look like they came from Paw Print Genetics. We get probably one a week where we look at it and we look up the dog and we can see that it's fraud that, and we cannot verify that that is the actual documents from the testing that we did on that dog. And so it's really important. It's really sad, but we've saved a lot of people a lot of misery and a lot of money because they send us the reports and we either can tell them that, yes, we've verified these reports and those reports actually are the dogs that were tested, or we say, no, I'm sorry, but those 
results are, are fraudulent and they do not represent results that we did. It ceases to amaze me that people still, the lack of integrity of so many people to be out in the world. My friends, I gave them your information for your website and I said, oh, here's, they were looking for a Doberman Pinscher and that's why I'm on it right now. And I was like, okay, here you go. Here's great breeders just to start checking out because they ended up finding all these backyard breeders through California. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We've learned, I've learned so much about backyard breeders here in Clubhouse. And what you want to stay away from is that you want to stay away from them because you're supporting an engine that's not healthy for healthy dogs, let's say. Once they get their puppy and they get this, is there a certain age that, that you wait for, for your dog to get tested? Um, so dogs can be tested at any age because the genetics that they're born with is the genetics that stays with them their whole life. Um, the only exception is is during your life, your life or your dog's life, your body accumulates mutations. And some these are spontaneous mutations that sometimes it's, it's a change in the DNA that's in an important gene that regulates cells and that regulation goes crazy and that's what causes cancer. So except for cancer, so we don't test for cancer, but the, you, for the most part, your dog is born with all of the the genetic information that it'll have during its lifetime, except for, like I just said, these spontaneous mutations that occur for everybody throughout your life. So we can test the dog at birth. We accept umbilical cords. Um, we um, will accept um, dew claws. So a lot of breeds, the dew claws are removed. Um, and then if you want to use one of our cheek swabs, which is a little device that goes inside the dog's mouth and you just rub and roll it inside the dog's mouth to collect cells, we recommend doing that around four weeks of age. And then any time after that, you know, some people like to wait a couple of years before they do their genetic testing. Um, or maybe you just acquired a dog from, um, a shelter and, you don't know much about it and you think the dog maybe is five years old, it's not too late to do genetic testing because we have some diseases that don't occur until the dog is eight or nine years old. Others like this um, retinal disease in, in dachshunds, sometimes it doesn't occur until the dog is 15 years old. So um, it's never too late to do genetic testing, but we do, we do a lot of genetic testing on newborn. Can you tell the age of a dog by the genetic testing? No, it's very interesting. We're actually working with a researcher who has developed a way to do that. And we actually just sent out a survey to our customers to see if people would be interested in it. And um, it was, as you can imagine, all over the board. Some people are like, nah, I don't care. And some people are like, yeah, I would order a test to see how old my dog was. And then we asked, well, how much would you pay for that? And some people, of course, said, you know, $5. And some people said $500. So it was right didn't really help us very much, but those kinds of things are definitely coming into our future. And as technology advances, is there going to be more um, awareness with these reports and these tests that you'll be able to perform? Like you mentioned, you don't test for cancer, and it would, I would think that that's a big one that people are looking for. Right. So we are currently developing tests for cancers that would be actually would be done directly on the tumor, and then based on the tumor profile, um, it would inform your veterinarian on what, are, what would be the best treatment. So that, that is something else that is coming um, in our future. It's just so beautiful. There's so many possibilities for so many tests and how it's going to help our pets in the future. In business, I believe they call your company is a disruptor to the industry in the sense that you're really making a difference in what you're doing and bringing such an added value to pet parents around the world. Are you, I'm sure you service animals around the world, right? Um, yes, we, we have gotten dogs um, sent to us as far away as Hong Kong and South Africa. And we get lots of, not the dogs, sorry, the samples. Um, we get samples from Europe all the time. South America. So yes, we service the entire world. Um, most of our market is in the United States and Canada. Um, but it's really exciting. You know, we have some um, regular breeders from Germany and Sweden, and it's always nice to see their samples coming in. So yes, worldwide. So in your mission statement, you talk about you're creating these outstanding reports for 
you, first you said domestic dogs. We talked about breeders. You say you talk about trainers. Why trainers? What? How does this affect trainers? So we actually get a lot of samples from trainers, um, especially trainers of sporting dogs. Um, we have quite a number of really large, well-known trainers who will take your Labrador, for example, if you're a hunter, and they will train them for you. So your dog may be gone for a few months, and then when you get your dog back, then the trainer trains you because you need to know how to signal the dog to do certain things. Because the trainer has the dog for a few months, they actually are the ones that will send us the sample. Um and it's important because, again, in Labradors, there's a condition called exercise-induced collapse. And if you find that your Labrador has exercise-induced collapse, you probably shouldn't use them for hunting or hiking or really strenuous things because they can collapse. Um, and so really those dogs should just, you know, be couch potatoes and be happy couch potatoes um, because the, the danger is that if they have a collapse, for example, when they're in the water, they could drown. Again... This is being proactive. This is understanding your dog's genetics and understanding what do you need to change in their life to make them healthy. Well, and that's a big thing is like how, you know, that's what I hear over and over on Clubhouse here. And we talk about this all the time is setting your dog up to win. And the more knowledge that you have about your dog, the more you're going to be able to set them up to win. And um, going to your next show dogs i can understand people wanting this for show dogs have you ever seen somebody that has gotten a test they're like no 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 i it, it like read the wrong way they were expecting it to read and they didn't want to know the information have you ever had that experience um yes um we have that experience a lot um where you know people are doing the right thing they believe they're doing the right thing and then they're surprised by the results and they're surprised because the dog you know they're spending a lot of money and time getting the dog's championship through showing it. And now, and that with the end goal of using that dog a lot, right? So you get a championship and then you're going to breed it and people want to breed with champions. And then they find out that the dog, you know, carries for something. It's really not the end of the world. What we do is we provide them information about how to, to use, you can still use that dog safely by breeding a dog that carries for a disease with a dog that is normal or clear, does not have that genetic mutation or that genetic change. And that allows you to produce puppies that are disease-free. Now, some of the puppies may be carriers, about 50%, but none of the puppies will have the disease. So we typically, you know, we do a good job of talking people off the ledge and, you know, getting them to understand that this is not the end of the world and this is how to breed responsibly now that you have this information. So that's actually magic for a breeder almost if they really were to look at this and they had this one test that came back, let's say with a negative response that they were looking for, but you're able to actually say now match them with, with this dog and it helps cancel out that issue. It, um, yeah, in a way, because, most of these conditions are what we call recessive, meaning that you have to get the DNA change or the mutation from both the mom and the dad in order to have the disease. You have to have two copies of the mutation. So if one dog carries one copy and one dog has no copies of that DNA change, then you can go ahead and breed those two dogs and produce disease-free puppies. Um, but about half of the puppies will be carriers. So that's why we do a lot of litter testing. You know, the puppies are born, and they want to know which puppies carry the further disease and which puppies are clear or normal, because a lot of times for their breeding, they want to keep back a normal dog. So that's how you can get rid of genetic diseases in your breeding program, is you go ahead and you breed the carrier to a normal dog, to a clear dog, and then you keep back a normal or clear puppy, that doesn't have that disease, doesn't carry for that disease. And then that way you can breed that puppy then in a couple of years from now, and you've now gotten rid of that genetic mutation. So it, it, again, it's knowledge and we help, we help breeders with that. They'll, they'll test all of their dams and tires and then they come back to us and they say, okay, now what? Who, who can, who can breed to Max and who can breed to Doug and you know, whatever the dogs are. And we, we help them match them and, and tell them, okay, these would be safe to breed, and here's what you can expect in the puppies. So we provide genetic counseling, and it's completely free of charge. 
You don't even have to be one of our customers. Uh, we help people with genetic counseling for all sorts of situations. Well, I like when people get the reports back, you actually give them the information inside the, re- the, re- the results, and then you give interpretations and recommendations. And so you actually help guide them in the right direction once they get the reports back, right? Right. So some people are comfortable just looking at our reports because you're right. We give the results and we give the interpretation and we give the recommendations. And other people um, like for us to go through that with them. So it just depends on the, you know, the person's comfort level. And we're happy with either. We just want to make sure no one's misinterpreting their results because some people have gotten results back that show that their dog is a carrier and they literally call us crying because they think their dog is doomed. It's like, no, wait, 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 wait. This is what it means to be a carrier. It does not mean they have the disease. So really, we really, really emphasize that if anybody has any concerns at all, once they get their results, that they call and they talk to them. And I'm so happy that you're here today. By saying things that we haven't covered, what haven't we covered, Dr. Elisa, in the sense of what are the top five questions people, when they come to you and they don't know where to go, what are the five top questions that they ask you? Well, the one question I think that is really important to understand is, um, you know, my friend has a German shepherd that has degenerative myelopathy with DM. Do I need to be concerned with DM in my rat carrier, for example? And so then we get into the, the conversation about, well, how did these diseases get into these different breeds? And the, you know, really when you think about it, you think about dog breeds, well, they were all developed from the domestication of the gray wolf. And so as the domestication process happened, mutations happened because obviously a chihuahua doesn't look like a wolf and neither does a great dane. So all of these breeds are an accumulation of mutations, cha- DNA changes that were desirable that humans thought, you know, I'm looking at my wiener dog and I think that that dog would be really good for going down rabbit holes and chasing badgers and chasing mice. And so the short legs of a lot of dogs that was considered desirable. And so that was, that's caused by a mutation. Well, along with all these desirable traits, there have been mutations for diseases. Some diseases happened very early during domestication and degenerative myelopathy is one of them. That's in a large number of breeds. And other diseases occurred later during domestication, during breed specific breeding And so the mutation may only be in, you know, one breed or a few breeds. So that's a question that we get a lot is people just really kind of getting their heads around the fact that whether it's the short legs of a dachshund or it's the, you know, retinal eye diseases of a dachshund, the basis of them are all the same. It's it's accumulation of changes in the DNA. And along with keeping these desired traits, um, unfortunately, there's been a lot of diseases that have tagged along. So that's really the, the number one question we get after the simple questions like, what should I order in my dog? But just sort of kind of understanding, how did this all happen? Why do I have to test for diseases in, in my dog? And why do I test for different diseases in a Labrador than I do in a Yorkshire Terrier? Do you find, since you've been doing this, do you find... Because what you're talking about, like, yes, all the dogs came down from the wolves. And that was back, you know, what, how many centuries ago? Um, Do you find that you'll see in different breeds the same strain of deficiency or issues that show up in their DNA testing? Like, you're like, oh, wow, these, I never knew that these two dogs were kind of connected in in this sense. Does that make sense? Um, Yeah, so... um I think I understand what you're saying. So, yeah, we have some mutations that we see in a large number of breeds, meaning that the mutation arose before all of these different breeds were created. And then we have mutations that are found in similar breeds. And that's because, you know, for example, a mutation in a Belgian shepherd is maybe found in a lot of other shepherds because they came from similar ancestors um and then we find mutations where we're surprised you know like the um 
the primary lens flexation, that's the dislocation of the eye lens. You know, it's in rat carriers and it's in Australian cattle dogs, you know, which is really weird, right? What does an Australian cattle dog and a rat terrier have in common? Well, they must have a common ancestor way back mm-hmm. when. It's found in a lot of other breeds too, but that's just one example of two breeds that you would think wouldn't be very related, but yet they have the exact same mutation for the exact same disease. What do you think about when people are still like, breeds came from people taking two dogs and putting them together and they created a new breed. And we see a lot of that, like with golden doodles. Do you see when people are still doing this with dogs, do you see that their mutation levels are higher because they're coming from two different breeds? Um, So with the, with the design, we call them the designer breeds, but um, yeah. So like with the golden doodles, our recommendation is that you do both the, the disease testing for the golden retriever and you use the disease testing for the poodle, whether you're doing using a, you know, a miniature poodle or a standard poodle. And so, and that's all on our website. So you can actually look up Golden Doodle and you can see that for the various doodles and other, um, you know, breeds that are being created from purebred dogs, their lists are long. And the good news is, is that we have a lot of golden doodle breeders and we have a lot of labradoodle breeders that use us and they're spending a lot of money and that's not the good news the good news is they care so you know it's really it's costing the designer breeders a lot more money than it is your average labrador breeder or your average you know scotty carrier breeder because these doodles you have to test for both parents breeds so you have to test for both the golden retriever and for the poodle. And it's expensive, but they're doing it. And that, I, I applaud them. I think it's fantastic. Wow, designer breeds, I never knew. Um, and I love the fact that with a designer breed that you do have to do both sides of the genetics. That makes so much sense. You have to do the golden retriever poodle as well for these designer breeds. I never understood how that would work, but that's interesting how that actually works. And it's nice to know because if you you have a designer breed, you need to look at both of those breeds. Carrie, is there anything that you've been listening to that's jarred a question for you or something that I haven't asked? Yeah, actually, I was just curious to see from Lisa um, what she thinks is the next big thing in um, genetics that's coming for, for the companion animal market? So I think definitely, you know, we've touched on a few of them, but I think um, understanding cancer in dogs and being able to provide genetic testing for dogs for either improving their treatment or even identifying the um, inherited risk factors for cancer. You know, we know that certain breeds, such as Golden Retrievers and Bernese Mountain Dogs, have a really high rate of cancer. They don't live as long as other dogs. And understanding that, I think, is going to be really important in the future. Um, and then there's a lot of research now being done on behavioral traits. And this is something that, for example, um, police dogs, it would be very useful to be able to screen dogs to understand their the genetics of their behaviors and to be able to early on identify a dog that's going to do well training as a police dog versus those dogs that are going to, you know, just really want to be cuddled and don't want to take down the criminal. Um, Because a lot of, it's really expensive. We work a lot with a lot of canine departments and it's really expensive. And when those dogs flunk out, you know, it's thousands and thousands of dollars and, and, you know, hundreds of hours that have been put into those dogs and they do flunk out. And so being able to do genetic testing for behaviors, I think, is another thing that's going to be really important in the future. How close are you for that? Well, we're not doing the research, but there's more and more articles coming out where they're identifying genetic changes that, you know, seem to be associated with certain behaviors. Um, Researchers are tending to um, concentrate on things like aggressive behaviors versus trainability um you know and we know that certain dogs already inherently you know they they they're easier to train that's why labrador retrievers and golden golden retrievers are really good guide dogs 
and that German Shepherds and Dutch Shepherds make really good police dogs. The Malinois make really good police dogs. But, um, you know, that's sort of where people are concentrating, both on aggression and also, you know, trainability. Because, again, the uh, Seeing Eye Dog program spend a lot of money on breeding dogs again and they they're hoping that they don't flunk out but when they do you know it costs them a lot of hours which is you know money and and time wow we've covered so much today and just about the future like the behavior part just makes so much sense especially because we talk to so many trainers right now and that with this pandemic and there's been so many issues with the change of behavior just when you're talking about it i just had this question and i don't know if you can answer this or not does with like the behaviors like does stress cause that mutation in dogs can that be a factor in the behavior no but i think that environment can um elicit certain underlying behaviors that wouldn't ordinarily come out so for example i you know every dog probably has its wolf tendencies right to bite um and if the dog is nurtured when it's a puppy it doesn't have those tendencies Whereas if a dog is abused, then it may become a biter. But then on the other hand, you have dogs that they're just biters. And that again is probably in their DNA. So you're talking to a geneticist and I think everything is inherited and I think everything's in our DNA. So, you know, whether you prefer math versus painting is completely in your DNA. So these are things that, you know, eventually as we understand the dog genome more, we'll be able to, you know, address these behaviors, um, whether it's to provide better support for trainers or identify dogs that perhaps are a danger to, you know, their owners or even to themselves or the other dogs in the household. What a fascinating room today we had with Dr. Lisa and genetics. I'm Michael, your host today, and I've got Carrie here, and I've got Dr. Lisa with Paw Print Genetics, and it's such a fascinating part of our puppy life and our dog life. That's I love that you're here. I love what you're doing. I hope that I can help spread your mission across Clubhouse as I go through it with people because I've fallen in love with just this idea of being able to like really be able to understand our dogs from day one and get ready to set them up to win and set us up to win to what to expect too. So I just think what your mission is and what you're doing, your vision, Lisa, is just fascinating and just incredibly beautiful that you're just being able to give yourself into the dog community like this. And you made the pivot. You, That's your journey. You made the pivot from the humans to the pups. And I see that all the time. And that's why I named the YouTube channel The Journey because – I hear this so often that everybody started in some form of a human side of life and all of a sudden they made that bridge and you've done it successfully here and you just offer such a great service. So I want to say thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Yeah, everybody. Thank you so so much for joining us with that. I'm going to go ahead and close the room with another wonderful room, healthy breeds, genetic testing with paw print genetics. We've got Lisa, Dr. Lisa Schaefer here and Carrie as well. Thank you all for being here once again. I'm Michael and I'm out. Have a beautiful day wherever you are. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa.